All right. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, 162. Um, we're going to uh, pick up where we left off last time. We were starting to talk about file systems, and we're going to move forward on that. But um, before then, I wanted to make sure to remind you of the queuing theory that we talked about. And uh, what you got was kind of uh, your very first taste of queuing theory. There's a lot more interesting things, many more interesting things you can do, and there are whole courses on it. But here we were assuming the simplest uh, assumptions here that uh, the system's in equilibrium and the queue is infinite in size and uh, that the time between successive arrivals is random and me memoryless, which essentially means that uh, you know, we don't have much more information about this other than the rate. And uh, the other good thing is, as I mentioned, memoryless is the shape of a lot of probability curves when you add a bunch of independent things together. So perhaps that assumption's okay. And on the exit, the server, we assume, has some arbitrary possibilities for, um, for its probability of service time. And so uh, we talk about its service rate is one over the, the service time. And we said uh, last time that if we had three, uh, kind of three of the five parameters, we could derive the other ones. So for instance, if we know the, the arrival rate lambda, we know the service time of the server, and we know the squared coefficient of variance, which is uh, sigma squared over m1 squared, where that's the mean, uh, then we can derive, for instance, the service rate, one over the service time, and the server utilization, lambda over mu, uh, which is also lambda times t sur. Now, what's interesting, as we mentioned, is the fact that this relatively flexible setup here with an arbitrary server uh, probability distribution is completely described by the three parameters in red here, which is uh, pretty astonishing, basically, that it doesn't matter kind of how complicated things are. If you know the service time and the squared coefficient of variance, then uh, you can compute the queuing. Uh, so parameters we might wish to compute, as we mentioned, were the time spent in the queue, TQ, and the length of the queue, which is just Little's Law. We talked a lot about that last time. And that's just uh, the rate coming in times TQ. Um, I also like to think of Little's Law as the uh, McDonald's standing in line law, as I mentioned last time. And then the results we came up with were uh, two possibilities. One, where the uh, server is memoryless. That's an MM1Q, memory in, memory, memoryless in, memoryless out, and one Q. Or if it's a general service time, that's memoryless in, uh, general, one Q. And uh, basically, the difference between the M and the G is whether C equals one or not. And uh, so what we came up with, uh, we talked about these equations, and I also pointed you at the end of the lecture last time to places you can derive them from, uh, take, take a look at some text. But uh, what's interesting, again, is that this relatively simple queuing behavior uh, can be used to figure out how long it takes to service, uh, say, a disk request taking into account all the queuing in the system. And the other interesting thing was that both of these behaviors have this uh, u over one minus u behavior, which uh, as the utilization goes to 100, the uh, time to respond goes toward infinity because the q keeps growing. And, um, and that uh, is exhibited directly in this simple q theory. OK. And I also talked you through some examples. Um, captions are not syncing into view, uh, to Zoom. Uh, OK. Um, the, uh, I guess I'm not supposed to do anything about that. So um, what I will uh, also, so this u over 1 minus u behavior of this thing growing to infinity is very interesting. Uh, obviously, any real, re, real q is going to be of finite length. And so in that instance, um, that finite length is going to not go to infinity, but it's still going to start blocking the arrival. OK. Um, Moving forward now, we were starting to talk about file systems uh, in which, by the way, if you're computing an end-to-end -end, uh, service time for a file system, you could use that queuing theory I just showed you. But now let's build a file system out of our devices. And we're going to talk mostly about disks today. And what we've got, for instance, is the name of a file. You're all used to that, which then uh, basically goes into a directory um, to look it up. And what you get out of the directory is a file number or an I number. And that's an index structure uh, pointer. And we'll talk a bit about what that index structure is. That's going to vary from file system to file system. 
But basically what that structure does is it says, uh, here are all the blocks on disk, for instance, that are part of this file. And um, so then uh, this is called the inode, and the i number names which inode is of interest. And then uh, from that file index structure, we can figure out which data block is uh, that's of interest to us because of where we are in the file. Okay, and I did uh, have pointed out a couple of times that usually the blocks that we talk about in the file system, maybe 4K, uh, are multiple sectors. So the sector is the minimal uh, unit that you can read or write from a disk, but we don't really use 512 bytes at a time because the overhead's too high. We combine them into blocks. Some newer disks, the sector size is actually 4K, in which case it's one sector per block. Um, now, I did uh, want to say something which is a little unfortunate is we have a conflict in terminology. So in the flash that I showed you last time, the word block uh, has this meaning of a bunch of pages. So a page is a four kilobyte chunk that you can read and write. A block is a bunch of those pages that are together on the chip and you can only, you have to erase a whole block at a time and then you can write pages within that block and you can never rewrite them. Uh, but anyway, so be aware of that slight conflict. And if there's a situation where it could be confusing as to what type of block, uh, I would say assume it's the file system block or ask somebody if it's an exam or whatever. So there are interesting pieces here we gotta figure out. Like what is this directory structure look like? What's the indexing structure look like? Uh, and how do we make sure the blocks hold our data? And so, um, here's, a, here's a brief version of that figure from the last slide where our directory turns into the file number, which gets us our index structure, which turns into a block. And uh, the first thing is that open is performing what we call name resolution, and that's translating the path name into the file number. And it, basically the, the result of that open is a file descriptor in the process control block in the kernel. And as you know, since you've been using files all term, that returns an integer handle to, uh, to the user code for um, reading and writing from that after it's open. And read, write, seek, sync, et cetera, operate on that handle. So all of the, uh, all in, in Unix style operating systems, all of the checking for permissions are all done at the open process. And so once you get past open, and then now you have a file handle, you can read and write the data. Uh, so directories you're very familiar with. So here's a picture of one from a, a Mac. But the idea is that directories have inside of them either directories or other files. And so this hierarchical structure, which you've all come to know and love, uh, probably since kindergarten, right, um, actually wasn't always there. I, I uh, <laughs> had to use some machines uh, back at IBM at one point that uh, had no directory structure. Everything was flat. And I'll tell you, it's really hard to organize a flat uh, file system where sort of everything is at one level. So uh, directories are a very good thing. Um, so basically, it's the directory is a hierarchical structure. Uh, every directory entry is either a, is a collection of either files or other directories. Um, and so really, if you think about this, it kind of suggests that a directory is really just a special type of file. It has name and attributes. Um, you know, files have data, directories have data. The real difference between a directory and a file is that the directory has some pre, uh, prescribed format to it to allow the name resolution to traverse the directory. And one thing we'll talk about a little bit later is this mapping from a name to another file or directory is called a hard link. And that hard link is actually a, a, um, an inode pointer that's bound into the directory with the name. And so it's called a hard link. There's also something called a soft link, which is a special type of file that says this, uh, this thing you're looking for is really somewhere completely else in the file system. Hard links are really kind of the bread and butter of the file system itself. Soft links are a convenience, and we'll talk more about that a little later. So what about the structure of a directory? So um, for instance, I wanted to point this out, perhaps this is clear to everybody, but how do you access slash my slash book slash count? Well, you could sort of ask this question, uh, which we do in exams all the time. How many disk accesses does it take? And uh, well, the first one has to involve 
reading in the file header for the root, that's slash, uh, and that inode for root now lets you read the root directory. And in that root directory, we're gonna look up the word my. And so let's read the first data block for the root. Assume for a moment that my is at the beginning of that directory. Um, and so we'll search linearly and probably come up with my right away. Yes, there's a question on the, the uh, chat about whether soft link and symlink are the same thing. Yes, they are. So once we've found my in the top level directory, that's gonna point us at another inode, uh, which now we can read in the file header for that directory. And we read the first data block for my, search for the word book, and then we can read the file header for book, search uh, in there for count, and now the file header we get is for the actual file. And at that point, we're uh, good to go and can start reading and writing the file. So notice this uh, long process of resolving and opening a bunch of directories until we eventually get to the right one. Uh, this is extremely expensive and would tend to indicate that you don't really wanna use something that's so deep uh, in your directory structure because it'd be too expensive. And so, uh, the the answer to that is twofold. One, these lookups are all cached in the operating system. And so there's actually something called a name cache that holds the latest versions of these and it gets invalidated whenever you change any of the components. The second thing is once you've already opened the say the file count, then you don't have to traverse the structure anymore because you have the I, uh, I number for the file itself. And the final thing, by the way, is this notion of the current working directory which uh, you've had some uh, experience with up till now, which is a per address space, uh, per process pointer to a particular directory. And so then instead of saying slash my slash book slash count, if your current working directory were slash my slash book, then you could talk about count uh, and opening just count without any slashes and the current working directory would find that for you. And so there's a lot of different caching that tries to make this lookup process a lot less expensive. Okay. Now, what is a file? Well, a file is named permanent storage. It contains data blocks, uh, which are on disk somewhere. So that's a little tricky for us because in principle, I mean, how does a user know where the blocks are on disk? They don't have any visibility into that. And so we're gonna have to do something to basically translate to the user's view of a file as a uh, bag of bytes that are sequentially put together that somehow live somewhere. Um, that's gonna be our file system is gonna help us with that. The files in addition to blocks that have the data also have metadata, which are attributes. Things like uh, who's the owner of this file, what's its size, when was it last opened or touched or any, any number of the time-based uh, metadata. Access rights, read, write, executable um, in a, ser a series of groups like owners, groups, other in Unix systems. Um, interestingly enough, in more complicated systems uh, like Windows for have access control, which is more arbitrary in that you can give ownership to arbitrary groups and, um, and users using the access control system. So that's a more sophisticated style of uh, controlling access to files. So um, when you do open, what really happens? Well, if you give it a file name uh, through the open system call, and the kernel um, has to basically go through its in-memory directory. Uh, let's assume that it's finally resolved to uh, the, the top level or the, uh, the bottom level directory that has the file in it. And in that directory structure, we pull in the parts of the directory that we're searching, and that's gonna point us to a file control block. And uh, so what we get out of the file control block essentially is an index to that, the file uh, control block, which is, uh, has all of the names of all the blocks in it that are part of that file. Um, if you look, once you've uh, opened the file, then each process has its own per process file handler table. And so when you read uh, um, a given file, what you're providing is the file descriptor, which is a, an index into this table, that index points to a system-wide table which has the file control block in it and can be examined to get data blocks. Okay, and so the structure of these in-memory data structures are really what we have to figure out when we start talking about a file system. Okay. Now, 
just because we can, let's start with uh, a the first file system we're going to talk about here is pretty straightforward. It's called the file allocation table or FAT. And this is the world's uh, most common file system. It started out on MS-DOS way back when, and now it's used pretty much in all of these USB sticks and uh, you know, every operating system knows how to read FAT, even though it's not a particular, particularly efficient way to organize blocks. But let's uh, start with this as our simple example. And uh, so assume for now that we have a way to translate a path into a file number. So we have some directory structure that already exists and works. How does the FAT file system organize itself? Well, there's this thing called the file allocation table, which is a large linear array from, that has uh, words in it from zero up to the number of blocks in the file system. And disk storage is just a collection of blocks on the disk. And so in order to make a file, we somehow have to indicate for every position in the file, which disk block is that. And so uh, really what we need to do is have our allocation table hold a, uh, a mapping from, off, uh, from the requested offset into the block and uh, offset within that block. And so for instance, uh, block zero of a file um, we're going to call it file number 31, you'll see why in a moment, uh, has a certain block to it. And um, block one and block two of the file are now spread across the disk. So what you see here is here's the set of all blocks on the disk. Block zero of file 31 happens to be at this point in that huge array of disks, of uh, disk blocks. Uh, block one is right after it. Maybe that's because I was writing uh, that file 31 and I got those two blocks in a row. Block two might be somewhere way down elsewhere um, on the disk. And so how do we put these together in a way or, or keep track of the ordering in a way that works? And the way this works, well, let's see this. Suppose we want to read from file 31 uh, block two offset x. What we have to do is we index into the fat with the file number, which is 31. And so we look at file number 31, and really what that says is file number 31 is actually the 31st block on the disk. And so um, the fact that we say that the file's called 31 is really stating that the very first block in that file is gonna be at position 31 on the disk, okay? And so then what the FAT has is it has an entry to point to the next block. Okay, so file number 31 has a pointer to what ends up being uh, block, so um, block 31 in the FAT has a pointer to block 32, it turns out here, which now has a pointer to this block, wherever that is. And so by starting with the file number, you, get, you figure out what index the first block is, and then you just start following the links until you get to the block of interest. Okay, and so for instance, uh, because we were interested in uh, block two offset X, we basically follow these links down, we read off of disk into memory, and then the last thing we can do is now that we've got that block, we can use X to give us our offset in the block. Okay, questions? So the, disk, uh, the, uh, the list is not doubly linked. That's a good question, it's just singly linked. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of, you don't seek backwards. <laughs> you start from the beginning and you work your way forward. So uh, now the one thing, uh, so this is already, that's a good question because you can see that this has some inefficiency built into it. It's the simplest possible way of indicating which blocks belong to which file. The one saving grace on this is in, really in uh, machines with a lot of memory, you just load the whole fat table in and then this, uh, tracing is a lot faster because you're not actually reading blocks from it. Um, so what are some properties of this system? Well, file is a collection of disk blocks. The FAT is linked um, is linked one-to-one uh, -one with blocks. There was a question on the, on the chat here in this example, where would file 32 be stored in the FAT? The answer is there is no file 32. Uh, so only some of the file numbers are valid in this instance because they point to the first block in a file. 32 is not a valid file, it's a valid pointer into the middle of a file. Okay, and 
the other thing that you can figure out from this right away is, boy, this sounds like you could easily screw everything up by jumping in the middle of a file. Uh, and there really is no control over this. And so um, you can start to see why FAT is A, extremely simple for little devices um, but, and therefore desirable, but B, not very desirable if you have any sort of worry about security. Um, the file number, uh, so uh, the, the difference between FAT and XFAT, so there's a lot of versions of FAT uh, which have um, in, increased size. Uh, so like FAT32, the original one, you could only have a 16-bit version of this. FAT32 uh, allows much larger pointers. EXFAT has some other properties to it. Um, but let's keep going on, on the basic FAT here for a moment. Uh, these are all variants on the theme, in case you are asking that question. So um, file offset is a block and um, uh, an index. And follow the list uh, to get the block number, as we mentioned. Unused blocks uh, are marked free, and there's no real ordering. So the other thing that's really unfortunate about this is if you need a new block, you have to just start scanning at the beginning of the FAT and finding the next block. And if you have lots of use of the block and the, of the file system and it's mostly full, then what we end up with is something that uh, has a lot of holes in it, but takes a huge amount of time to find uh, the holes, okay? And um, these are free blocks, but you actually have to scan to find them. And the other thing to note here is that, um, notice that this there's no locality by definition in here as well. So if you've done a lot of reading and deleting and reading and deleting of a FAT file, which you find the file system is you end up very quickly with um, problems because uh, the, there's no locality whatsoever. Okay, and, and so you're seeking all over the place. So this is um, very undesirable for spinning storage, less of a problem for something like flash storage on a flash key. So let's look at an example of writing. Suppose we want to write uh, file 31, block three. Well, notice there is no block three. So we have to get a free block and link into the file. So here's an example. We grabbed a free block, we linked it into the file. And then we can write, okay? And so, uh, so we grow the file by uh, allocating three blocks. And uh, if we open a new file, here's an example of file 63, uh, it might be linked somewhere else. And so what you're looking at now is a file system with two blocks in it, or two files in it, excuse me. Uh, one file with four blocks, the other with two blocks. Okay, so what about this? Well. Uh, it's simple. You can't argue that. Uh, it's used in Windows, USB drives, SD cards, cameras, phones, you name it, it's there. Okay. Uh, where is the FAT itself stored? Well, it's stored uh, in an early part of the disk and some of the early blocks, but um, usually is, if you have enough memory, you load as much of it as you can into memory uh, at boot time. What happens when you format a disk? What you're really doing is you're marking the, the FAT entries as free and optionally zeroing the block. Um, so Windows 10, uh, so the question is, does Windows 10 use FAT? So it's a, the question, uh, it depends on how you're asking that question. So Windows 10 can read and write FAT because you can plug a USB drive into Windows 10 without any problem. Uh, most people that have Windows 10 and in fact, earlier versions of Windows have all formatted a second file system called NTFS, which we'll talk about a little later. So the primary file system is absolutely not FAT, but certainly Windows 10 can use FAT. And anytime you plug a USB key in uh, or, or attach your phone or whatever to a Windows 10 box, you're gonna be able to read that file system. Okay. Um, so as I was saying about formatting, you can see that um, uh, we could zero all the blocks and then, and then mark all the entries as free, and that would be one way of making sure that the data is properly destroyed, although uh, you really want to write over a bunch of zeros and ones and so on. Um, but oftentimes there's a fat, um, there was a fat uh, uh, file system, that, um, excuse me, there's a way to basically format quickly, which would just redo the fat here and leave all the data in.
Sometimes that's done accidentally, and you can try to have a recovery program that tries to find, uh, reconstruct the blocks, which is sometimes successful, sometimes not. There's a, there's a statement on the um, chat about uh, Windows XP using uh, the FAD file system. Yes, uh, there, there was definitely uh, a more prevalence of FAT earlier in time. Um, but, and you could, uh, you could um, format your C drive as FAT and a lot of consumer, um, process, a lot of consumer uh, products did that, but uh, you could also use the Windows NT file system once you got past Windows 10 pretty easily. And so uh, if you're worried about reliability, most people don't do FAT for that. So what happens when you quick format a disk, basically marking the entries as, uh, as free and leaving the data in the blocks? So pros, very simple. You can actually implement it in firmware. OK. Issues. How long does it take to find a block? Well, you've got to linearly scan this linked list. So this is really bad at uh, both random and sequential access. Okay. Um, What's the block layout for the file? Well, it's haphazard. It's whatever happened to happen, you know, whatever blocks were free when you were writing it. Sequential access requires a lot of pointer chasing. Random access requires a lot of pointer chasing. And this is illustrating what we often call fragmentation. So what you see here is that uh, green and yellow blocks are interspersed with each other. Um, there are defragmentation tools that can be used to bring all the blocks of a file close to each other and sequential, and that will overall speed up the performance quite a bit. Uh, certainly for reads, you can do a lot of sequential access, um, et cetera. What is um, unfortunate is then as you start using and deleting and modifying files, then the, uh, then the holes open up and you need to defrag every now and then. So small files are extremely efficient, right? You can have a file that's one block. Big files, less so. Okay. Now, what about the directories in the FAT? Well, uh, as I indicated earlier, directories are just files. In the case of um, the FAT file system, what they are is they're a series of linked entries which map a name and a uh, file number um, or block number. And so if you were trying to look for uh, home Tom foo, then what you would do is I'm assuming that this is home slash Tom directory. And so in that you would look for foo, that would give you a pointer, which you could now point into the fat and start the first block of the file system. So the directory is a file, right? So it is a file containing file name, file number, mappings, free space, uh, is in here for uh, new and deleted entries. And whenever you delete an entry, it just leaves it as free and sort of links over it. Um, where do you find the root directory? Well, every file system has, a, has to have an answer for this. It's uh, always at a well-defined place on disk. And for FAT, this is at block two. Um, there are no block zero or one. Don't ask me why, that's just the way they numbered it. Um, remaining directories are accessed via their file number. Okay, questions? Now, FAT has lots of security holes, okay? Nobody in their right mind uh, would claim that FAT is secure. Uh, there's no access rights. You can't say this person is not allowed to see it. This person's not allowed to write it. Um, there's no way even in principle to track ownership of data. So that's a problem. Uh, there's no header in the file blocks. And so what that means is there's no way to enforce control over the data since um, kind of all processes have access to all the whole FAT table. And so um, there really isn't any way to prevent people from jumping in the middle of files and so on. And you're just following pointers to disk blocks. So FAT was designed back in the day when, uh, when operating systems on personal machines were very simple. Um, okay, I said that already. Okay, that's gonna be what I'm gonna say about FAT um, unless we had any Final questions. So we can hope to do better. Uh, and that's what we're gonna hope to do today. So um, in order to do better, we should know what we're trying to achieve. And so there've been many interesting studies over time. I present this one just because it was so thorough uh, 
at the time, it was over a number of years at Microsoft, and it was looking at um, meta, uh, the file system metadata, and I'm gonna take these two graphs separately. So the first one was the characteristics of files, and what you saw here is that in 2000, uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, what you see here is these are the number of files um, in the file system of a given size. So this peak here, for instance, is the peak of 2K byte files. Um, how many of them in the system uh, have are two kilobytes in size? And this says there's about 3,000 of them in 2000, but by 2004, there were 10,000 of them. And what you see, uh, two things from this, one, uh, the number of files was growing without bound and ridiculously quickly. And secondly, that most of the files in the system are small. We're not talking about eight, eight megabyte files or 128 megabyte files. We're talking about 2K files. So small files are important to optimize for uh, in the kind of system we are looking at here, which is, is kind of a standardized Unix system. But although most of the files are small, most of the bytes are in the large files. So if you look at this, this is a different graph. And what this is, is this is the, um, the size of the files, and this is the number of bytes in each of those. And what you see is these are peaking out at the 16 meg region or two, you know, eight meg region. So most of the space is occupied by large files, which is not entirely surprising. You might have a whole bunch of system files, which are small, but then some video files, which are large, and they're basically taking up most of uh, of the data, or most of the, the space on the disk. Okay, so there's a small number of really big files and a large number of really small files. So it'd be nice if we had some way to build a file system that could handle both of these well. Okay, enter the Unix file system. So the original inode format appeared in BSD 4.1 for the, uh, that's pretty prevalent now. It was uh, the Berkeley standard distribution Unix. Woo hoo, right, Berkeley, go Berkeley. Um, part of your heritage, and it's very similar to Linux's uh, ext2 or 3. The file number itself is an index into node arrays. Yay, Berkeley number one. Okay. <laughs> the file number is an index into inode arrays. Um, and an inode is a multi-level index structure that uh, describes everything you need to know about a file. So it's good for little and large files. Um, it's an asymmetric tree with fixed size blocks that basically uh, helps, being, it helps in being good for little and large files. And I'll show you what that means in a second. Um, the metadata associated with the file, not the directory. So what does that mean? That means that this inode structure self-describes who's allowed to access it and with what access rights, uh, when was it last accessed and so on. And that's part of the file, not the directory. And so it doesn't matter which directory you put a file in, it has well-defined perm uh, permissions, which are part of its structure. So a particularly good instance of this was the Unix fast file system, BSD 4.2, uh, which um, was a follow-on to the 4.1 BSD file system structure where locality heuristics were put into play, better block group uh, placement, reserving space, et cetera, to get performance. So the first version at BSD 4.1 uh, was getting a lot of functionality in there. 4.2 helped make it fast, okay? And uh, Unix also has a scalable directory structure. So we'll talk about that in a second, but here's a basic idea of what we've got on disk in uh, the fast file system. Um, so we have an inode array, which is just uh, a bunch of blocks on disk that hold inodes. Each of these inodes is typically something like 128 bytes. So in a, you could hold a bunch of them in a single disk block. Okay, and an inode we said describes the file. And so that inode has metadata, which are like who's the owner, what are the read write permissions of this file, et cetera. It has a set of direct pointers. What's a direct pointer? A direct pointer is in the inode structure and gives a direct block number on the disk. And so a direct pointer directly points to a block. A, an indirect pointer points to a block that has pointers to blocks. A doubly indirect pointer points to a block that points to a block that points to blocks and triple and so on. The reason we use this structure the way we do 
is this inode for small files is extremely efficient because in the inode itself, we point to all the blocks that are in use directly. And so there's only uh, pull the inode into memory and then directly access the blocks for small files. So it's extremely efficient for the type of files that we've decided we have a lot of, which are small ones. How do we handle the big ones? Well, we handle big files with these indirect, doubly indirect, and triply indirect pointers, which let us get a very large number of total data blocks for large files. Okay. And the, um, the other thing to think about for a moment here is the efficiency of going through this data structure to get all of these blocks at the end is less worrisome for really large files because we're pulling in so many files. And so many of these indirect blocks uh, get pulled into memory once and then they're traversed multiple times. And so when we're using really large files, this particular data structure holds them well and doesn't suffer from those kind of uh, uh, inefficiencies you might worry about because of all these intermediate blocks. So the file attributes up here in the metadata structure, user group, um, which nine basic access control bits, um, set UID bit, which executes at owner's permission. So if you put set UID, um, in an inode, that means that if a, any user tries to access that um, file, the first thing that'll happen is that the operating system will change to the owner's permission uh, in order before it starts executing. And so that's how, for instance, things that require root permission um, can be used by users because they have a set UID bit. Now the question was um, uh, here was why why indirect blocks again? So the answer is that for a small amount of inode space, the indirect, doubly indirect, and triply indirect blocks lets us describe a lot of blocks, okay? But we don't wanna leave all of that space in an inode for direct blocks because that would mean that our inodes are huge, but we only use um, a small number of the direct pointers most of the time since most of the blocks are small. So the, the reason we have this structure, this asymmetric tree structure is really um, since most of our files are small, they can all fit all of their blocks directly in the inode. For ones that are a little bigger, um, they only have to worry about a single indirect block. And for the really large ones, we spread the pointers to the data blocks over more disk blocks. I hope that helped. Um, so the question is, so are they di essentially different parts of the file? So I'm wondering um, which what you mean by that. Let me try this again. So if you were interested, suppose that there are 10 of these direct blocks. If you try to read something that's at block nine, okay, you'll uh, start scanning, you'll get to block nine because it's in the direct pointer set still and access the block directly. If you want blocks 10, you have to basically load the direct, uh, indirect block first and then block 10 is gonna be here, 11, 12, 13, 14. Then once we get past uh, all of these blocks, there might be a thousand of them then, then we go to the doubly indirect, we load this guy, this guy, and that's our next block. So all of the data blocks in the file uh, is, are along this axis over here and figuring out how to get to block 593 is knowing what this structure is, okay? Now, let me, um, let me uh, back up here. There was one more question of what's the limit here. So the, the typical limit with a, um, the Unix inode structure is it doesn't go beyond triply indirect, okay? And that's just because of the size of the inodes, which are set to like 128 bytes. And so that's a, an optimization that's been chosen. The inode array itself, um, as I mentioned earlier, is actually stored on the disk, but then um, when you pull an inode, uh, when you access a certain file, you pull its inode into memory and then you start accessing this. If, uh, if the inode has no pointers to give, the file's too large, then you get a write error. Uh, you, you are not allowed to write past that point. So, so this, uh, this represents a hard limit on the maximum size of the file. And so that's why um, uh, these data blocks in the original file system were actually 512 bytes. They've become 4K bytes over time or 8K or even larger. You can, like in Linux, you can have 16K data blocks. And that's to allow much larger files uh, on really big disks. Okay. Now, uh, let's see.
So why would a block be separated from the la the other ones? Here's another question. So um, the the reason that um, each of these blocks are separate is that's basically because of the way the disk structure is. So the disk is divided into a ser series of blocks, really sectors, but we put a bunch of them together into blocks. And so we need to keep track of which blocks are part of which files. All right. Now, um, hopefully that helps. Now, um, now we can start to talk a little bit about this. We're going to go for forward in a moment, but you could imagine that these blocks could be spread all over the disk and this file would be extremely painfully slow to access. So part we're, we're going to have to access, part of what we're going to have to talk about is how do we make sure these data blocks are mostly sequential on the disk itself? And that's going to be a design point for us. So um, metadata, as I mentioned, uh, the most interesting thing you probably haven't thought about as much is a set UID bit and set GID bit basically are bits that you can set um, when, when you're the owner of a file that allow uh, things to be, for instance, accessed as if you were, say, root. And so things that have to manipulate, um, that have to actually manipulate uh, things that only the, the uh, operating system root can do, you can produce a, a file that's an executable that can do that optimization and actually um, access those things by setting the set UID and set GID bits to give permissions so that anybody can run those files. And as you can imagine, this is an attack point. Um, you know, one way to attack a system is to figure out how to set the set UID bit on it, and then suddenly you've got uh, what should be a user accessible or a um, user mode file uh, executable has suddenly got root permissions, and now it can do all sorts of damage because it can act as root. So the data uh, pointers, I mentioned the direct pointers, okay? So um, Linux actually has 12 of these. Um, so 4K blocks give you 48 uh, kilobytes of directly accessible ones. And that's basically handling the fact that we have lots of small files, okay? And uh, the large files we handle with the triply e indirect ones, okay? And so four kilobyte blocks has 1,024 pointers at each level. And so basically you can get four terabytes at level four if you had a level four, um, four gigabytes at level three, et cetera. Okay, and so uh, one differentiation in between different file systems is kind of how many direct blocks are there, what's the maximum number of indirect levels you can have, and so on. So are the data blocks for each file in contiguous memory locations on disk? No, so they don't have to be. These actually could be spread all over the disk. If they were in contiguous locations on the disk, then it would be very efficient to read quickly. So you can see that there's a huge benefit to arranging these to be on disk well, but that's the trick, okay? That's the trick. You have to make sure you do that. And the original, uh, the original version of the file system from 4.1 BSD didn't do any attempt to make things be sequential. And as a result, when you ran uh, the file system for long enough, it started to get really fragmented and uh, things were very slow. So, uh, the BSD version 4.2, uh, 1984, uh, was same as BSD 4.1, so it had the same file header and triple indirect blocks, et cetera, except it incorporated ideas from the Cray operating system to basically get us to allocating things sequentially. That's our key, right? And um, so it used bitmap allocation in place of a free list. So uh, you just sort of line all the blocks up in a linear order, and now you just got bits to say which ones are free and which aren't. Um, and it did a really, uh, worked really hard to allocate files contiguously. But if you think about the interface that you're now very familiar with all term, uh, you open a file and you start writing it and the operating system really has no idea how big that file is going to be. So you could stop after you write 2K or you could stop after you write a terabyte and there isn't any obvious difference in that interface. Okay. And so what happens in the 4.2 BSD is it spreads everything out and allocates things in chunks in a way that tries to optimize for as much sequential access as possible. And one of the tricks there is reserving 10% of the disk space always being free uh, so that you can probabilistically find long runs of blocks to put into files as you're constructing them. There's also something called skip sector positioning, which made a lot of uh, sense in the old days. I'll show you in a moment what that was. It's not used as much anymore. 
So the problem here is really uh, when you create a file, you don't know how big it will become. So how much contiguous space do you allocate for it? Well, what you do is you find a range of free blocks and you put each new file at the front of a different range. And so really you spread the beginnings of the files out as much as you can in order to give you successive blocks that uh, can be allocated together. Um, and you store, uh, the flip side of this though, is you also store files from the same directory near each other so that when you do an LS, uh, dash L, I'm sure you guys do that a lot. You can see all the metadata pretty quickly because it doesn't have to seek a lot to get that metadata. So the fast file system was really this uh, BSD 4.2 file system. And um, I put a paper up uh, on the readings for you guys um, on the uh, resources page, which is the fast file system descriptor page paper. And we, uh, we actually studied that sometimes in, uh, in 262. So let me show you uh, one optimization that was uh, pretty important back in the day when this first came out, which was a rotational problem. And the idea here is that um, you, you read a block, you do some pro processing, you go back to read the next block, but by the time you get to reading the second block, the disk is turned past the first block. So it's actually bad in this scenario to have blocks absolutely right next to each other on a track because uh, these older systems would read a block, do some processing, come back to read the next block, and it'll miss it. And so you end up with sort of one rotation for every read uh, of a block, which sounds awful. And so what was the trick? Well, they allocated their data with skip sector. Okay, and so the idea would be that the pink and the blue represent different files, and so you'd allocate blocks with sector skips in them where you compute the amount of skipping based on this processing delay. Okay. And that's very dependent on what processor you had, what your interrupt time was, and so on. Uh, and so that was part of what the BSD 4.2 file system did. Today, of course, you don't have to worry about that. And if you were to go to Seagate's uh, website and look at the specs on a disk drive, for instance, what you'd find is it's got DRAM on the disk. What is that DRAM used for? Well, among other things, it's used for track buffering. And so the way we solve this today is you, you load a whole track at a time and put it in RAM, and now successive accesses to that track buffer are at full speed and don't require you to worry about rotational delay. And so these track buffers are a huge importance to performance. And if you look, there's a lot of, of memory on modern disks, okay? Megabytes and megabytes of memory. Okay. Um, so as an aside now, modern disks and controllers do a whole bunch of things under the covers. There's track buffers that I just mentioned. They do the elevator algorithms we talked about last time. They filter out bad blocks and by giving you a, linear, a logical block uh, ordering. And so pretty much the operating system is insulated from a lot of the things that you used to have to worry about in terms of optimizing for disk access. That stuff is hidden inside the controller on modern disks. And so what's, what's a funny side effect of this is a lot of operating systems have uh, residual scheduling in them that tries to optimize for these things that the controller is already doing. It's almost like having an appendix, right? Uh, you know, this is like the operating system's appendix with respect to disks and it's busy not functionally trying to do uh, elevator algorithms and buffering and stuff uh, on single tracks. And, um, you know, at best it's going to get in the way of the controllers. And so um, modern file systems have started stripping some of this stuff out. Okay, and as you can imagine, when you get to flash, a flash file system absolutely filters that kind of stuff out, okay, because it doesn't have to worry about rotation. Okay, let's take a, um, a brief, uh, let's take a brief pause. We have a, uh, a good question here in the chat. Um, so the question is, is the size of the inode array the limit on the number of files you can have on your disk? It is a limit, yes. Um, you could, uh, by, um, allocating too few uh, inodes, you could actually uh, have a limit on how many files you are allowed to do. Um, and so that's actually a parameter on formatting as to how many inodes you have in the system. Um, so in principle, you could run out of inodes and it, it has happened in the past uh, to me, but um, usually the parameters that you get with formatting are pretty good and you almost always uh, or almost never have to worry about that. 
Okay. So, uh, okay, I think our break, we can continue. Um, so, uh, where are the inodes stored? Well, in early Unix and uh, Windows FAT file system, they were basically in a special uh, array on the outermost cylinders. So all the inodes were, say, on the outer part of the disk. Um, and this is uh, kind of silly because the headers were, the inodes were basically not stored anywhere near the data blocks themselves. And so just to read a small file, you'd have to seek to get the header and then seek back to the data. And so just the existence of inodes uh, way out on the edge there uh, kind of destroyed locality by definition. Um, and they were a fixed size set when the disk is formatted. Um, and at formatting time, fixed number inodes are created. Each is given a unique number. And that number is used to index into this array. Uh, later versions of Unix, including the FAST file system, which I said the paper is up there on the website, uh, move the header information to be closer to data blocks. And in fact, the inode arrays are actually, there's many of them spread throughout the disk. And um, the, and the way we do that, basically, both with uh, BSD fast file system and Linux CXT 2 and 3, is there are actually things called cylinder groups. And um, the cylinder groups actually have the inodes in them. And as a result, uh, the inodes are much closer to the data itself. And uh, the pros of doing this is um, by putting the file headers on many cylinders, you get that performance advantage. Um, so for small directories, you could probably fit all the data, file headers, et cetera, in the same cylinder with no seeks. Um, and uh, the other kind of important thing about this is uh, the reliability of this original layout of inodes was horrendous because if you got a head crash, which literally means that the head on the disk hit the media and started digging holes into it, and you got a head crash on the outer part of the disk, you would destroy all the inodes in the system and as a result, essentially destroy all the data because you didn't know what was linked to what. And so by spreading the inodes throughout the, the disk, uh, you've much, made it much more likely that even if part of the disk is damaged, uh, you can still find a bunch of files and, and their associated data close to each other in different file groups than uh, wherever the disk had touched down. So that's a good thing. Um, and it was part of the fast file system. And uh, it's basically part of the optimization to avoid seeks. And it's also got its uh, reliability benefits as well. So here, for instance, was the block groups. They're just series of concentric rings. You've got uh, free space bitmaps and inodes in a block group. And so each block group um, has its own free space and inodes, OK? And uh, data blocks, metadata, free space is inter interleaved within the group. Um, so you're avoiding huge seeks. So basically, it's quite possible that you could, once you got to the directory you're interested in, you could move back and forth only within a block group and not have to um, scan out while you were essentially doing things within a given directory. Okay, and so now the directory, all its files are in a common block group. And so now things like ls-l, which is uh, what I do all the time on Unix systems, basically, you know, tell me all the files in this directory and what its metadata is, are much more efficient because they just have to stay within uh, a block group. Okay, now um, the other thing is these block groups are using something called first, uh, first free allocation, which is when you expand a file, what you do is you first try to find successive blocks in a bitmap that have uh, a bunch of consecutive blocks in it. And um, eventually, when the file gets big enough, then you might go to a separate block group uh, to look for big strings of files, because in that case, uh, you know that uh, this file keeps growing. Maybe I need to find a big uh, run of three blocks, because it looks like, uh, with high probability, it's going to get even bigger. But the important part about this allocation is really that you have to keep 10% or more free. This is just a probabilistic statement that uh, if you have at least 10% of your blocks free, then it's far more likely that there'll be larger runs of blocks that are free. Um, and it's, you know, experimentally, they found that if they kept 10% of the blocks sort of in reserve, they were far more likely to do good allocation. And so that's a, maybe it's a surprising the first time you hear it. But um, in fact, when you're running a Linux file system and it tells you that you're out of space, 
it's probably the case that you've used up 90% of the blocks and there's still that 10% there. If you're the uh, super user or root, then you often can go ahead and over allocate, but that's uh, probably not something you wanna do because then your file system will start performing very poorly. Uh, so this is the uh, trying to find, if we have a small number of blocks, we might fill in uh, a small uh, chain and then we can also find bigger strings to, uh, to help us allocate for larger files. Okay. So the pros of the fast file system was efficient storage for small and large files, locality for small and large files, and metadata and data, no defragmentation. Cons, uh, very inefficient for tiny files. So like a one byte file still needs an inode and a data block. Uh, inefficient encoding when files mostly contiguous on disk. Uh, if it's mostly contiguous, what you'd like to do is just sort of point at the start of it and, uh, and then have a series of um, sectors afterwards that were all part of the same file. You know, why bother having a bunch of pointers? And of course we need to reserve this 10 to 20% free space. So that may be a con. Okay. So the XT3 or uh, two and three disk layout has uh, similarities exactly to what we just told you about. Okay. So disk has divided into block groups, providing locality. Each group has two block uh, size bitmaps, three blocks and inodes. Um, block sizes are settable, so you can actually, at, um, at the time that you produce the file system, you can have a 1K, 2K, 4K, 8K block. Uh, the inode structure is very similar to 4.2 BSD with uh, 12 direct pointers, whereas the original BSD had 10. Um, the only difference between EXT2 and EXT3 is the addition of a journal uh, that will help you, you can see journal contents up here, that will help uh, make sure that when um, your machine crashes that the file system is more likely to uh, avoid corruption. And we'll talk about how to use uh, journaling a, a little later uh, next time. So um, let's talk a little bit more about directories. So basically directories are stored in files and can be read, but typically you don't read the file, uh, the directories directly, um, but you could in principle open a directory and read through it assuming you have access to that directory. Um, it's system calls that basically uh, manipulate these. So open or create traverses the structure to create new entries, uh, make deer, remove deer, add and remove entries, uh, link and unlink, basically link an existing file to a directory. So for instance, this file down here, user lib 4.3 slash foo, um, I could have a link in user lib as well, a hard link if I wanted. Um, to that, and so I could have an entry in this directory pointing at that directly, uh, and that's a that's a hard link. Okay. Um, the other thing I could do is this hard link now is part of the directory system, uh, and so if I were to remove this file from this directory, uh, the file would not get de deallocated because I've got a hard pointer to it. Uh, the other option is a soft link where what I have here is a, rather than an actual directory entry, I just have a special file called foo in user lib and foo is marked as a soft link or a sim link and has the full path of foo in it. That's a little different from a hard link. That's a soft link. And in that case, I could accidentally delete the file um, on, underneath and that soft link would still think it was pointing to something that didn't exist. Whereas hard links have explicit checks on them. And so when you delete a file, it deletes uh, all of the things that are pointing at it as hard links. Okay. All right. So these, uh, there's a bunch of libc support, open deer, read deer, et cetera, for directories. And that's basically uh, operating system level support for manipulating directories, which yes, they're only files, but rarely uh, do you ever write a, a directory yourself. In fact, that would be a bad idea and it's disallowed unless you're root. So hard link, as I said, sets a directory entry to contain the file number of the file. So it creates a separate name or path for the file. Um, you can't make loops with uh, links, hard links. Um, soft links or symbolic links or shortcuts, um, some operating systems call that, um, are basically a, f a special type of file that really just contains a path and name of the file. And it's really mapping one name into another and it's completely independent of the actual files. And so here with soft links, you can easily create loops if you wanted to, et cetera. Um, but it's not, 
uh, and they're not explicitly uh, referenced, counted, and so on. But you'll see a lot of soft links. That's ln l. Excuse me, ln s is how you make a soft link. Um, and many of you have probably done that. You can do man on ln for link to see how that goes. So uh, one downside of a lot of the original Unix file systems were that the directories were linear. And so to find, uh, to find a, a file in a huge directory, you actually had to linearly search through the whole directory. There was no index structure on it. And that's still the case for a lot of operating systems, uh, a lot of Unix operating systems. In some of the variants, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, there's actually the, what should be, have been obvious, the ability to put an index on top of a directory so that when you're looking for some file, uh, there's actually an efficient search to find the uh, I number with it. Um, and uh, this is not available by default on all operating systems, um, even these guys. But uh, it's the obvious thing. And uh, if you're ever wondering why a um, directory becomes extremely slow when you put a lot of files in it, it's because this indexing structure is not always supported on all operating systems. So an NTFS, uh, the new technology file system, which is, uh, you know, this is uh, new, is, is old now, uh, back from the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. It's the default on Microsoft Windows systems for everything except for um, things like USB keys and so on. Um, variable length extents rather than fixed blocks. So the interesting thing there is in uh, the file systems we were just talking about, every block is 4K or 8K or whatever. And uh, variable length is um, in the NTFS says that the blocks are really just runs of blocks. You point at the start, you know how long it is, and now you got to run a blocks. And so NTFS doesn't have to have a pointer for every block. It does this nice uh, optimization that if you have a really large file and there was a run of free blocks, you just have to point at the beginning of the block. And uh, so it's much more efficient in terms of total metadata for files. So um, the interesting thing about it is pretty much everything's a sequence of attribute value pairs, which are metadata and data tied together. And I'll show you that in a second. And you mix direct and indirect uh, block, uh, direct and indirect addressing very freely. Okay, and directories do have a B-tree structure, so they're efficient. So um, basically the way this works, and you can look up, I've got a link here uh, to learn more, but NTFS has something called the master file table. And that master file table is, rather than there being a root file system, the master file table is a database uh, with very flexible one kilobyte entries that map metadata and data together as an entry. Okay, and then variable size attribute records come out of that. So if you have really small files, you can have the directory entry, the inode structure, and the data are all together in one of these entries in the master file table. So this is extremely efficient for small files. And when you want to get to big files, what you do is you have one of these entries, and then it points to these big attribute uh, attributes that basically point at runs on the disk. Okay, And so this master file table has a whole bunch of small file records, which basically have everything in them, complete uh, the, the name, the uh, metadata, and the data all in one chunk, one, one kilobyte chunk. But when you have something very large, then that uh, entry in the master table basically points at a bunch of other extents, and each of those extents can point at extents. And so you get to very large files only if necessary. Okay, and ext4, which is a follow-on to ext3, for Linux has a similar kind of structure, okay? And when you create a file, not surprisingly, you can provide a hint as to how big it is. So if you're thinking this is gonna be a really big file, you give a hint, and therefore the file system can allocate a large chunk of data if you're gonna, or a large chunk or extent if you're gonna have a really large file, and they could do that at open create time. As a result, uh, then you're not having to guess on the fly how big this thing is gonna be, or figure it out after the fact, like um, basically the uh, BSD file system does. And NTIFS has a journaling mechanism, which we'll talk about next time for reliability, or we'll discuss it later. So here's a small file master record. Um, there's some standard information like create time, modify time, access time, owner ID, et cetera. The file name itself, the data, okay, 
And that's just one record, okay? So this is extremely efficient. And notice uh, that this, what we talk about this data is it's an attribute list. So it can have a list of um, name colon data attributes and so uh, you can have multiple streams of data. So this, this file system supports a single name having multiple streams. It also allows you to put, as things in this data can be pointers to other master file table records or to extent pairs. And so you can basically build a tree out of this that builds large files. Okay, so here's an example of, for instance, a medium file where the record, instead of the actual data has pointers to um, a start and a length on disk for an extent, and it has several of them, okay? And so that's a way to get bigger files. Really, uh, the, uh, the downside of this is because we have variable sized extents rather than blocks, which are fixed size, means that now we have fragmentation problems. And so yes, NTFS has a um, potential fragmented uh, file system problem. And so it tries to do a bunch of dynamic stuff, uh, just like, uh, the fast file system did to try to prevent that fragmentation and keep long runs basically. But potentially, if you've been reading and writing an NTFS file system uh, a lot and deleting a lot, you can get a fragmentation situation where you can never allocate these large extents anymore because there aren't any large runs. And so then this degenerates into uh, a lot of really small runs and it gets really inefficient pretty quickly. And then you can run a defragmentation style thing on it if you like. Okay, here's a huge badly fragmented file. Isn't that funny? So you basically have the first uh, master uh, record then points at a bunch of other master records that are in the master file table, which then maybe points at extents as well. And so you can build, uh, I like to think of these as Franken files. They're pretty big and, and messy, but um, it's extremely flexible. And notice the key thing that we started with is that it's extraordinarily efficient for small files and can handle really large files, assuming that you haven't gotten a, a significant amount of fragmentation. Okay. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about interfaces to files. So you're very familiar with uh, this idea of you open a file, you read it, you write it, and you close it. But, and that's pretty, pretty much what I call traditional I.O., which is ex uh, explicit transfers between buffers, uh, and uh, in the process address space and in the kernel, you, you execute a read, you pass a buffer into the read, the read goes into the kernel, it finds your data and brings it back. And this involves basically multiple copies uh, uh, into caches in memory and so on, and plus system calls. Uh, you might ask a, a different question, which is what if you could quote map the file directly into memory and then just do memory reads and writes? That would seem like that could be a lot more efficient and would avoid all sorts of uh, multi copies and uh, between buffers and would avoid uh, system call overhead. And so, uh, well, could we do that? And yes, we can. It's called MMAP. And by the way, uh, executable files are treated this way when we uh, exec the process. So, what actually happens when you exec a, a binary off disk is it maps that disk file into memory and then it demand pages in as you start running the executable. And so really you've already used this memory mapping but didn't know you were doing it when you used exec. So just to remember for a moment, um, here we have an instruction that's accessing uh, the mem memory man management unit. If the page is properly in the page table in a state that is accessible by this access, then uh, we get the page in memory and we access it. Otherwise, if the page table is invalid or we try to do a write and the thing said read only, then we'd get a page fault. That page fault uh, causes an exception handler and the page fault handler, which goes and pulls the page off of the disk, fixes up the page table, and now uh, sometime later the scheduler returns and starts re-executing that process and the second time it now works, having pulled the block in. So if you look at this, uh, this swap drive or swap space that we just talked about is on the disk, just like a regular file. So what if you have files, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna memory map the files using mmap into parts of our address space. And now uh, here's a uh, page table entries mapping a file. 
And so now um, that mapping is in theory pointing at files on the, on the disk. And if I go to try to access something in that space and I get a page fault because there was no page table entry, I do the same thing I did before. I get an exception handler. It pulls in uh, a block of the file into memory, fixes up the page table. And now the next time I go through, I can basically directly access the file via this memory. And so if I'm doing a load, I would be reading from the file um, just by doing a load, okay? And so this, um, what I've done here is I memory map the file and now reads and writes basically give me access to that file uh, directly. If I write to this, they get pushed out to the file, okay? So, so this is called mmap. You guys should all uh, do a, a man on this to see what it looks like. Uh, MemMap allocates memory um, or map files or devices into memory. It's got a lot of arguments. Um, the, uh, the ones of interest here for the moment are the file descriptor. So this is the file you're mapping. Um, and then the address where you want to put it in your virtual address space, you could leave it at zero. And then what will happen is the MMAP system call will pick a space that's free in your virtual address space. And what gets returned from MMAP is the new allocated pointer, which represents the file. Okay, and so it may map a specific region or let the system find one for you. So that's the difference on whether you say, you know, try to map me at this address and it will either uh, succeed or fail, or if you put a zero, then it'll find one for you. And it's used for both manipulating files and for sharing between processes. So uh, for instance, this file descriptor could be a file that's used to talk between two different processes, um, and that would be one way to set up commu mutual communication. Okay, let me show you a simple example here where um, what we do is we, uh, we give it the name of a file, that's M file, and we first of all print out, you know, data heap stack, uh, what the different addresses are for that. We go ahead and open the file, uh, and once we've got the file open, and we've checked our errors, then we're going to M map it. So notice by putting a zero here, I'm saying, well, find me some spot in my address space wherever you can. Um, we want to be able to read and write the file, and we're mapping a file, and we're mapping it shared, which basically means other processes may be doing this, and so it helps to make sure that things get pushed out uh, to disk from memory. And then here's the disk descriptor of the open file. We map it. We're going to print uh, where it is in our virtual space, and then we're going to just put some data on it, okay? Um, right here with the string copy, and that, what do I mean by that? That's just it's taking the string let's write over it and it's writing at uh, the thing that was returned from mem map plus 20 bytes and so by copying into memory we're actually writing the file so this is m map okay and so for instance if here's this example if we cat the test file it says this is line one this is line two line three line four but then we run m map okay with test and what happens here is it tells us some addresses and notice m map returned um, something uh, close or proximate to our data, okay, which makes sense. It's kind of in the data regions that are free for mapping. And what, after we're done right, uh, running MMAP, what should happen? Well, if we cat test again, look at this. This is line one, the, let's write over, it's line three, this is line four. If and notice this is, uh, we're gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, there's a new line, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, starting zero, that'd be 20 here is where L is. And so let's write over it. Basically happened just because I copied onto memory and it uh, went on to, to the disk as a result. Okay, so that's MMAP. So the point at which write back happens, uh, you have to be careful about. So there are uh, special M flush operations you can do to make sure it goes back. Also, when you close, it'll go back. And there are a few other uh, ways of making sure it gets flushed to disk. You can look at the man page and so on. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is when we ran MMAP here, we uh, gave it a file descriptor that was a file. We can actually do uh, give it a file descriptor from um, the shared memory system call that will allocate some memory for us and return a file descriptor to that memory which we can then map this way. And now we have memory we can share between two different processes uh, without backing it by disk, okay? And so it doesn't, this doesn't have to be a disk um, option, okay? So here's an example of doing that. So both 
uh, processes are going to map the same file name into their memories. So this is its memory space, this is its memory space. Notice that they're not the same part of the virtual space because in this case, we uh, put zero on mmap and said, find me what you can. Uh, we could, through a separate communication mechanism, come up with the address space uh, that we want to map and then have both of them try to run mmap with a specific address if we wanted to sort of exchange uh, data structures or whatever. And now, basically, these files are mapped into memory. And now, as I read and write to, to that part of memory, I'm actually communicating. Okay, And so uh, this is a way to get inter-process communication working. But it's backed by a file. If we want it to be backed by uh, memory instead, we can uh, do what I said earlier, which is allocate, uh, using the shared memory allocation functions, something to put in here. Um, or we can do something called map uh, um, rather than file. We can do anonymous, and then it will find us some spare memory that's not backed by disk. Okay. Um, all right. So let's say a little bit about caching before we end up for the day. So um, as you can imagine, or as you realize, disks are very slow. And so uh, what we want to do for the file system is we want to build a cache. And I already said, you know, everything in operating systems is a cache. Um, and you can quote Kubi on that if you like. But um, you exploit locality by caching data in memory. And so many different things can be cached, even with the file system. So one is those name translations, which are mappings from paths, you know, slash my, slash book, whatever, to inodes. Those are cached as name translations. And uh, disk blocks, mappings from block address to disk content, are also cached in the cache, and they're cached in something called the buffer cache. So this is memory used to cache kernel resources, including disk blocks and name translations. Uh, it can have dirty blocks, which are blocks that are not on disk. So if you remember, we would call this a write back cache. The replacement policy is typically LRU, um, and you can afford the overhead of timestamps or linked lists or whatever you want for LRU because um, basically, we're only worried about the granularity of pulling things in and off of the disk, not every load and store. The advantages here is it works, uh, this kind of caching works extremely well for name translations because you don't often change the names. And it works well in general for the disk cache as well, as long as uh, memory is big enough or you're not sort of striping across all of your disk. So the disadvantage, of course, uh, there are disadvantages. Um, one of them is it fails when some applications scan all the way through the whole disk. You can easily uh, cast everything out of memory, which is a problem. So for instance, if you do find dot dash except grep foo, whatever, this is basically grepping for the word foo through every file in the file system. You could do this as a way to completely blow out your file cache. Uh, you could imagine other replacement policies than LRU. So for instance, some systems actually allow applications to request policies. A good example of one that you might want is use once. So if you, if you uh, ask for a use once policy because you're gonna walk across a lot of things exactly once and you don't wanna blow out your cache for other, you know, other things that are in your cache, then you might use the use once policy. So the cache size, you might ask how much virtual memory should the OS allocate to the buffer cache versus virtual memory. So you can imagine there's a, a tug of war here because um, you, know, you wanna have enough pages for your virtual memory so that you're not thrashing, but you wanna have enough buffer cache so that uh, you're getting good behavior out of your file system. Um, too much memory of the file system cache, you can't run many applications at once. Too little memory of the file system cache, um, Many applications may run slowly because they're accessing the disk all the time. There is a point here to decide. The solution uh, today, these days, is to adjust the boundary dynamically to try to find something in the middle of what's the right amount to give to the buffer cache versus virtual memory. Um, I, when I first started uh, building kernels way back when, uh, you actually had to have a compile constant to say sort of how much you put in each category, and that was uh, kind of unfortunate because how did you guess? Right? Um, so uh, one of the things that caching uh, does is free uh, read ahead prefetching. So when you read a block, it often reads the next couple of blocks out of the file because it's highly likely they're going to be needed. And it's exploiting the fact that most common file access is sequential. Um, 
The elevator algorithm can efficiently interleave groups of prefetches from concurrent applications. Whether or not the elevator algorithms, uh, elevator algorithms run in the operating system doesn't matter. What uh, is true here is um, if I have enough requests, even ones that are prefetching from different parts on the disk, then whoever is running the elevator algorithm, operating system or the disk controller, can rearrange them to do a good job of uh, access. How much do you prefetch? Well, if you prefetch too much, you're going to blow out your buffer cache and pollute it, is the term there. So, um, so what you basically do is a small number of reads is kind of what happens. OK. So we'll pick this up next time. Actually, I'm going to finish one more thing, if that's OK with you guys. Um, delayed writes. Our writes to files are not immediately sent out to disk. So the reason we do that is so that if we think about a compile, which generates a whole bunch of um, it generates a whole bunch of temporary files. If we don't push things out to disk right away, it's quite possible that uh, we can create files, uh, write to them, use them, and delete them, and they never have to go to disk. Okay, so that's one big advantage of delayed writes. Another advantage is if you have files that are overwritten multiple times uh, by waiting uh, before you push out to disk, you're basically uh, getting some efficiency that way. All right. So um, the problems so are delayed writes have a lot of performance, and we're going to have to talk more about the consequences of this, which is basically if you crash at the wrong time, you can actually lose data. Um, and the original Unix only flushed data every 30 seconds, so that's a problem. Um, or you know, it was a good, you got the good performance out of the delayed writes, but uh, you had that vulnerable window of 30 seconds where you might lose the last 30 seconds of your data. Uh, so the advantages of delayed writes is you can efficiently order a lot of requests. So if you have a bunch of dirty blocks in your buffer cache, you can choose how to send them out, or you can send them out in groups, and uh, uh, the elevator algorithm can basically rearrange them to do a good job. Um, you can run uh, disk allocation knowing the correct size. So if you uh, have a bunch of things in your buffer cache that are writes, you can say, oh, look, there's actually 30 blocks there that we haven't pushed to disk. Let's find a run of 30 free blocks. Okay, And also, you uh, can avoid maybe writing temporary files in entirely. Disadvantage is system crashes, Okay, because you could lose a bunch of data. And what we're going to do for that uh, next time is we're going to talk, or the time after, we're going to talk about how journaling can help uh, save us. Okay, so in conclusion, file system transforms blocks into files and directories. You optimize for size, access, and usage pass patterns. We're trying to maximize sequential access, but have random access as a possibility. Um, we're going to protect uh, the OS uh, protection and security regime with metadata. Okay, um, File defined uh, by a header called an inode. And that inode looks different depending on what the file system is. Um, naming translates from the user visible names to the system resources. Um, which is the inodes, for instance. So directories map from names to uh, other files or directories. The directory can be a linked tree uh, uh, or a linked or a tree structure. And we talked about multi-level indexing schemes. Um, inodes contain file info, direct pointers to blocks, indirect pointers, et cetera, which optimizes for many small files, but a few really big files. NTFS gives a, a variation on that, which allows you to have extents. All right, so I think we're done. Uh, we talked about 4.2 BSD with a bunch of different optimizations. We talked about layout driven by free space management. And we talked about memory management is really using mappings between memory and uh, the disk. And we can start using those on our own to do some interesting uh, types of communication. All right. Good luck, everybody. We're going to call it a day. Um, as you've seen, we're mailing out info about how the exams are going to happen. Um, we're still on track to doing something on Thursday. I'm going to wish you all really good luck. And uh, we have a lot of communication over uh, Piazza and with the TAs and so on. So um, best of luck. I hope you have a great evening. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Good night. Thank you.